Informal Fallacies Part 4 Fallacies of Unwarranted Assumption and Diversion Fallacies of unwarranted assumption assume the truth of a questionable claim, i.e. one of their premises is not reasonable to assume in the context of the argument. Now the premise in question could actually be true. It could be unreasonable or unreliable even though it's true. How is this possible? Well, a premise counts as unreasonable if the audience of the argument is unlikely to believe it unless they already accept the conclusion of the argument. So in other words, this unreasonable assumption is something that itself requires proof of proof or evidence in support before the conclusion is proven. And by the way, even though I'm using to illustrate this, the concept of assuming making an ass out of you and me, as the proverb goes, keep in mind that not all assumptions are problematic. In fact, every argument starts with assumptions. Those assumptions are the premises. It's impossible to prove every assumption you make. If you're going to make an argument, you have to start with assuming something. So assuming is not always unreasonable. However, in these fallacies of unwarranted assumption, you're making particular assumptions that are unreasonable in the context of the argument based on the meaning, the particular claims being made by those assumptions. Begging the question is an argument that assumes what it's trying to prove. There are three, at least three sub varieties of this. The most blatant is when a premise is just reworded in the conclusion. Or there could even be cases where the premise is restated word for word in the conclusion, although that's less common. A second type of begging the question is where the argument assumes highly controversial key information. Now, this second type is technically the same as every other type of fallacy of unwarranted assumption. What qualifies it for begging the question is when the assumption made is actually quite close in meaning or significance to the conclusion itself. So once it gets sufficiently close in meaning or importance to the conclusion, you can then say the argument begs the question. A third type of begging the question is circular reasoning. Sometimes the word circular reasoning is used synonymously with begging the question. However, it can also refer to a sub variety in which the same statement appears both as a premise and as a conclusion in the argument, but in such a way that you're not sure if it's intended to be the conclusion or merely the premise or both. So it tends to go back around multiple times. Here's an example of begging the question. Murder is always wrong. Therefore, capital punishment is always wrong. This argument commits a fallacy because the conclusion only follows if you assume capital punishment is murder. And that's basically committing the second type of begging the question fallacy. Because murder is defined not just as any type of killing, but as wrongful killing. So if you're saying that capital punishment is murder, that's almost the same as saying that it's always wrong. Complex question is a single question that contains multiple parts and an unproven hidden assumption. Now questions don't usually appear in arguments, but they can appear as rhetorical questions where you're using a grammatical question to actually indirectly assert a statement or proposition. Example, is Donald Trump still colluding with Russia? This implies that he was colluding with Russia. Now this may not be a controversial assumption in certain audiences or contexts. But if you're trying to make some particular claim about Trump and his relationship with Russia to a skeptical audience, you cannot use this assumption even when it's hidden in question form. The appeal to ignorance fallacy tries to prove a conclusion based on a lack of knowledge or evidence. So you're trying to prove something definitive when your premise includes a claim that we don't know one way or the other. There's two varieties of appeal to ignorance. Either you're arguing a statement must be true because it has not yet been proven false, or a statement must be false because it has not yet been proven true. Here's an example. Scientists cannot prove that intelligent life does not exist on other planets. Therefore, it does exist on other planets. The appeal to authority or appeal to unqualified authority tries to argue for a conclusion 
by relying on claims of people who don't have expertise, training, or knowledge relevant to the argument or to the conclusion. Example, Gwyneth Paltrow stands behind Goop's products, so they must be good. Now, it's possible that they are good, and it's even possible she does have some genuine relevant experience with some of the products. However, this is going to be highly, someone's expertise is highly contextual. The same person is not an expert on all things. Gwyneth Paltrow's profession is actor, so that alone does not make her especially qualified to comment on the particular effectiveness of healthcare products or other products of this company. Also, since she's the paid spokesperson, she's probably a biased source. False dichotomy fallacy assumes that only two choices or possibilities exist when in fact there are others. Example, if you don't agree with our country's policies, then you should go live somewhere else. So this ignores a third possibility, which is if people don't like the policies of a given country, they could stay and try to change them. Now there are true dichotomies in the world. So false dichotomy is only a fallacy when um, there actually are more than two possibilities, but the argument assumes there are only two counter to fact. Fallacies of diversion change the meanings of words or phrases or otherwise attempt to divert attention from the original or the real issue. So these distract you from the original point the argument is supposed to be making. In a fallacy of equivocation, the conclusion of an argument relies on a shift in the meaning of a term or phrase in the premises. Example, my financial advisor said I should avoid risky investments. With any stock, there is a risk it will go down in value. Therefore, I should avoid investing in stocks. So the word risk is used in two different ways. If a financial advisor is giving this advice, typically they would mean avoiding especially risky investments or highly risky investments or unnecessarily risky investments. The second use of the word risk is different. It just has to do actually with any sort of probability. There's a chance it will go down in value. There also could be some uncertainty that's suggested there. You're not sure when it's going to go down in value, etc. So this conflates two different meanings of risk. In logically valid or logically strong arguments, there is logical connection between the premises and between premises and conclusion. And so the equivocation makes it appear as if there is a logical connection there because the same word appears in both premises. However, it has a different meaning in each premise. A straw man fallacy is one in which an opponent's argument is misrepresented to make it weaker or less plausible and thus easier to attack. The fallacy is named after the traditional custom of creating a straw man of someone you don't like or disagree with and then burning or beating the straw man. This is also referred to as burning someone in effigy. If you really hate someone and can't attack them directly, you can make a dummy of them and then attack or burn that. So here are a couple of examples of straw man fallacy. Atheists believe the world came from nothing. How can something come from nothing? Atheism is absurd. Now it's possible that particular atheists believe that, but the definition of atheism is just someone who doesn't believe in God. This is a separate issue from a belief in how the world was created. Logically speaking, believing in a God or not is a separate question from a belief about how the world began. Also, even if atheists are unsure of how the world began, that's not logically equivalent to believing it came from nothing. Also, even if atheists don't believe in God, it doesn't mean they don't believe that uh, the world came to be in a certain way. They may have an alternate theory of how the universe came to be. So this is a straw man fallacy because it misattributes positions or beliefs to atheists. Uh, here's another example. Religious people trust in blind faith over the evidence of their reason and senses. Religious people are completely irrational. So this counts as a straw man fallacy. It may be true that some people who are religious only do trust in faith and ignore any other source of evidence, but it seems like it's more common for religious people to also try to justify their beliefs based on rational arguments and even based on things that can be experienced or observed in the world. So these are two examples of straw man fallacies that could occur on either side of a debate between theists and atheists. And indeed, you see these particular straw man fallacies very commonly. 
In a red herring, the argument changes the subject in order to divert discussion in a new direction. This fallacy is named after a custom of using a very stinky or smelly pickled uh, or fermented fish um, called red herring, it have a reddish color, to divert hunting dogs from game after game had been spotted and down. If you didn't want your hunting dogs to eat or mutilate the game, you would take out some red herring, throw it away from the game, the dogs would smell it and go after the red herring instead of whatever they had just helped you hunt down. At least that's what I've read online, so I choose to believe as the name, the origin of the name of this fallacy. Here's an example. Some people argue that widespread use of internet and social media is shortening people's attention spans. But this is nonsense because the internet and social media allow people around the world to connect in ways that were previously impossible. This is a nice, somewhat subtle example of the red herring fallacy. It can also be even more blatant. The reason why this is red herring fallacy is the first claim is about widespread use of internet and social media shortening attention spans. The second claim has nothing to do with that. It just diverts your attention to a new topic. It's trying to make social media and the internet seem good, having some other positive trait. This is a very common tactic in debates or arguments because a lot of debates and arguments are about feeling good or feeling bad, either about a thing, a person, a cause, or a movement. So you think you're countering someone's argument that criticizes something by providing another argument which praises it. But this is a red herring fallacy. It does not connect logically to the original criticism or objection. You can't prove that social media is not shortening people's attention spans by pointing else to something it's doing that might be good. You have to make a specific targeted rebuttal to the claim about shortening attention spans. Maybe the evidence for this claim is weak, for example. Fallacy of misleading precision is when an argument uses a numerical or statistical claim that appears to be important, oftentimes because it's a large number or a precise number. It appears to be important for or relevant to an argument, but in fact is not. Here's an example. Reduced fat Oreos contain 30% less fat, so you should start eating them if you want to lose weight. This is a kind of obvious, somewhat extreme example of the fallacy, but it does illustrate the point. Just because reduced fat Oreos contain less fat than normal Oreos, it doesn't mean that they contain little fat in an absolute sense. Also, they may not contain much saturated fat, but they could contain other macronutrients such as sugars and refined carbs that will not help you lose weight. So this is an illustration of why this type of use of numbers is a fallacy. Missing the point fallacy occurs when the premises of an argument seem to logically lead to one conclusion but instead they're used to support another unexpected conclusion. So it's like the premises could be used to prove something, but they're used to prove something else logically unrelated. This fallacy can work psychologically because you're giving evidence for a claim, but you just pull a switcheroo at the end and introduce another claim. This fallacy is similar to red herring because it introduces another irrelevant issue. The difference between missing the point and red herring is that red herring doesn't typically provide a lot of justification or an elaborate set of reasons for an alternate claim. It's just more of a direct sort of attempt to divert attention. Here's an example of missing the point fallacy. The Affordable Care Act has been difficult to implement. There were system failures in which people could not log onto the government's website and cases of people's private information being compromised. Therefore, the government should never try to solve social problems. Now, the premises in this argument could be used to justify a claim such as the Affordable Care Act should be repealed or revised, or there should be additional legislation passed to protect people's private information, whatever. But the claim that it's being used to justify is different. It's not just about the Affordable Care Act. It's about a much broader claim. Um, and so even if the conclusion is true, this argument does not help prove it. Now let's look at some sample problems. The sign says there's no mass on Sunday. My teacher said that mass is the same as energy. So I guess there's no energy on Sunday either. This is the equivocation fallacy. Now it's kind of a lame or silly example because it's reusing the word mass in such an obviously different way, but it does illustrate the way this fallacy works. 
In the first sentence, mass is being used in the sense of the Christian communion. In the second sentence, it's being used in the sense of physics, which is an energy state of matter. A lot of newspapers, magazines, and publishers are going bankrupt. The cost of printing presses, newsprint, and ink is rising. This is no time to be financing movies. This is missing the point fallacy. The first couple of premises could be used to prove some claim about print publications, but it's being used instead to prove a claim about cinema. World population is calculated to reach 9.7 billion by the year 2020. Therefore, the government should set a legal limit at one child per family. This is a misleading precision argument. Even though this claim about population is true, this number does not justify a specific legal or political policy. In order to justify a policy, you have to do a lot more than just cite some statistics about what's happening in the world. Some of the things you need to do are to show the likely consequences of the policy and also to show how these consequences are better than that of other competing policies. Those are the two minima criteria for justifying a policy claim. Michaela Peterson, daughter of famed Canadian professor Jordan Peterson, advocates a carnivorous diet. Therefore, you should switch to a carnivorous diet. This is an unqualified authority. Unless someone is a nutrition scientist or other nutrition expert, um, then they don't count as a qualified or appropriate authority for a claim like that. Um, there can be exceptions, right? Someone who's not a full-time or professional researcher or uh, practitioner, but who's done a lot of research on their own. But in general, you need to at least provide evidence of someone's qualifications, whatever they may be, before using them as an authority to support a claim. There are many people calling for the President of the United States to be impeached by Congress. These people need to show some respect for the office of the President and the institutions of the United States. This one seems to be a false dichotomy fallacy. It's assuming that either someone respects the president and the institutions of the US or someone um, calls for the president to be impeached, but not both. In fact, it's possible that people who call for Trump or another president to be impeached are doing it because of respect for the office and they think that particular president has not shown sufficient respect for the office. So you believe in evolution, do you? Since you're descended from apes, was the ape your grandmother or your grandfather? This is a straw man fallacy for two reasons. The first is that people who believe in evolution by natural selection believe that modern humans descended from ancient hominid species and that modern ape species share a common distant ancestor with modern humans, but not that modern humans are directly descended from modern ape species. Also, people who believe in evolution by natural selection don't believe that it operates on species like hominids uh, that rapidly over the course of a couple of generations. So if you look at our last common ancestor with apes, you're talking millions of years ago, not a couple of generations ago. Next up, part five, recognizing fallacies in ordinary language.